microdose, yeah, microdose. Hosted by Kush Hayes and Robin Seto. Talking to talk, cause they got things for you to know. Let's go party with Miss Robin in the games on Cameo, yeah. Microdose, microdose, dose, dose. Microdose, microdose, dose, dose. Microdose, microdose, dose, dose. Microdose, microdose, dose, dose. What gets this next? No matter who it is, every episode's the best. Every episode's the best. Every episode's the best. If you disagree, you're crazy simple as chess. Micro dose, micro dose, micro dose, micro dose. I'm gonna count them in five, four, three. Micro dose, yeah, micro dose. Call me Ishmael. Actually, call me Kush Hayes. What's good, y'all? Kush Hayes here. Episode 53, the micro dose, volume two. With me as always, Robin Seto. Miss Robin, if you're nasty, how are you doing tonight? I'm feeling good. I've, um, I'm very excited. It is an exciting night. And um, I threw that Moby Dick quote out earlier because three years ago, me and my, our primary guest, Kai from Cushion Kai, him and I did a, uh, used to do a podcast, still do a podcast, but we did a specific episode on a classic movie from 1996 starring Mario Van Peebles. It was called Solo. Oh. We completed it. Kai, how you doing? Oh, so good. I have so many good memories of just coming into that movie with no expectations and just being won over by the Tin Man becoming human. And um, <laughs> that started a quest. Uh, and and um, yeah, no, we're here today. It was a goal I didn't know I wanted to have. I, I sent out a tweet just for S's and G's. I, I tagged the director, Noberto Berba. <laughs> uh, Barba. <laughs> Norberto Barba, <laughs> and uh, he, he replied back, and he went, you know, hey, thanks for, th I'm glad you liked the movie, and uh, it wasn't my first, but he, you should check that out, Blue Tiger. He and, replied uh, back to correct you on uh, his first and or second film. <laughs> <laughs> that man is with us tonight, Kai. It, it, <gasps> it's been a minute and a half, but we, we got him. He, he, he's been busy as hell. He, he's made time for us. Everybody, Norberto, Barba, how you doing, sir? What's hey, good? thanks for having me. Nice. Uh, as you may or may not see, I'm a little nervous here. This is uh, this is huge for us, man. You know? Oh, it's great. It's, it's great being on. Uh, and I love that folks kind of look back at that period. There were some interesting movies being made then, mm -hmm. uh, especially in like that low budget, you know, mid budget range that are kind of. If you want, look at them, that you think, oh, is it a time capsule? And then at the same time, you say, no, actually, it kind of plays all right. <laughs> you know? I watched it last night uh, just just to do it, and it holds up. It's it's nice to see Adrian Brody just yeah. pop up. What well, what was he like? Is he wasn't necessarily a name, and if you had asked me, I would have said the first movie I'd recognized him from was uh, Spike Lee's The Summer of Sam, which a few years later. Yeah, well, there was a, a period. Uh, back even more where uh he was involved in uh in some in low budget independence uh if i recall there was one about a jewish mob so he, he was around and then they brought him to my attention i thought he was perfect he was great you know and uh, he was so awesome to work with down to earth you know and uh, uh we were in uh, mexico in the jungles of mexico for about 10 weeks wow. and um oh, it was uh, it was tough shoot you know i remember one time i came back to where, where i was staying and uh my then girlfriend who's my wife now uh said ah. wait she said wait stop and there was a red mark a little red dot in my arm oh, wow. and she goes and she told me strip down and take everything off what and i stood like this and she started taking ticks out of my body. Oh, oh wow! And and I was taking. And so the next day, I showed up with uh, combat boots, gaffer tape around my combat boots, long <laughs> pants, long, long shirt, and what's the draw bag? You, it was so hot, I was dying. I couldn't breathe. It was so hot. But at least uh, I had ticks on my body. You know? Were you out there just in the wilderness and like a pup tent, or like was there a motel nearby, or like? Oh, cause we were right there uh, outside. Uh, we were based in Puerto Vallarta. Oh, yeah. And, and the jungle was actually the jungle where they shot Predator. Oh. Uh, actually, we used several jungles. Well, the one with Predator, and then there was one more north, if I recall. And But the Predator jungle, when they did the movie, they actually 
uh, constructed a, a road, a dirt road to get deep into the jungle. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of used that to get deep in the jungle. And then at the end of the day, we took the road back and we were in civilization. But I tell you, being in the jungle and uh, it's tough. I was, I was, I was uh, meaning to get to the fact that Adrian took it, uh, was a great sport about it. And uh, man, he was great. Yeah. How was MVP on the set? <laughs> you know, MVP was a, a completely committed. The movie got made because of him. And he really went all out to make sure that it was the way he wanted it, the way that he felt comfortable. He also was very supportive and collaborative. And uh, so, you know, again, his his stuff was so physical. So he had with him uh, a whole uh, workout station. So right before the shots, he would work out in between, you know, at lunch and everything, because he was supposedly, you know, playing a robot that was like this uh, a supreme a specimen of hum- of of what a human would look like. And uh, so he was he was committed, and and we had fun with that. Yeah, he looks. I mean, of of many human specimens he's one that looks just amazing in his underwear and uh that that translates just on on cellular You're like well look at that guy yeah there he yeah. is him and like jason taylor like the defensive end for uh, the dolphins uh, right, of your, right. uh yeah th- they're right there it's yeah. funny you mentioned I, I mean yeah for predator that it was right there um because we had a we have had discussions before it was like well solo is a pretty high level character like he's taking out cartel folks he can duel with the american military and i i'm pretty sure i i would throw my chips in like he could probably uh, he could probably take out a predator i mean he's he, he's uh, uh especially thermal null for for right. his power source right. and he's in the, he's battling in the same jungles and uh yeah i mean he's overpowered i i think for this situation right hello versus predator predator was, uh, predator was a mean looking you know creature. oh yeah you know, I, I have to also bring up something about Mario. He came into it also as a, a storyteller and filmmaker. He had done New Jack City. Mm-hmm. You know, his father was an accomplished, uh, a well-known it. filmmaker. And so when I spoke to him during the process, it was like I was speaking not to an actor, although I was, mm-hmm. but in addition, a fellow director, a fellow storyteller. You know, and to just to give you some history of the movie, I had done Blue Tiger. Yeah, Blue did. Tiger was very interesting because it was sort of a it's a revenge thriller with the yakuza. Mm-hmm. I, I made I tried to go really stylistic, and it got good reviews. They were comparing me between a cross between uh, John Woo and Abel Ferrara. Uh, <laughs> with that movie, I thought, hey man, I'm in great company. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So after that, then I got offered a uh, solo based on that and uh, solo was based on um, a, a book called weapon hmm. and in the original book it was all about drugs it was uh, the villagers were forced to grow poppies you know hmm. heroin and all this stuff and solo had to come in and, and save them i at the time i felt that there was just an abundance of these drug movies and you know cartels and all this stuff and i pitched it i said why don't we do something that actually is kind of timely with what was going on in central america you have a lot of rebels and they're building air bases wherever they can and Mm -hmm. and they're they're actually forcing villagers to to help them even whether or not they abided by their politics or not and i thought it would be really cinematic to try to get an airfield out there and all that other stuff and they went with it and that was an interesting way to go. And I remember they had wanted me to shoot in the Philippines. They were thinking about, oh. let's shoot this in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And I had suggested Mexico for different reasons. I mean, because a buddy of mine has a really good company down there. So I knew the logistics and the infrastructure was already there. And nice. it really proved correct. So I still use those guys on Minds MC years later. Mm-hmm. And a couple of other TV movies, too. We're going to come back to Solo and we're going to talk about a couple of squeeze a couple other things in here. Let's go back a little further, though. 1963, the Bronx. Take it with a grain of salt. I understand you went to Regis High School, followed by two years at Columbia, a transfer to USC, and then some, some time at the American Film Institute. Well, what's the goal when you start? Where, how, how do you start and then what is the goal? 
Right. Well, it's interesting. They say that with immigrants, it takes about three generations, two to three generations for the kids to go into the arts. Dang. That the earlier generations always go into more safer sort of occupations. The idea was I was going to be a doctor or something. And I, that's why I went to Columbia. Mm. And, but I had always been involved with theater and, and, and then all, uh, subsequently film. Especially at Columbia, I was taking all these graduate film classes that the only film courses at the time was in graduate school. So I would take whatever I could because I was really interested. But then, it, and it had a very Eastern European bent. Uh, Milos Foreman ran the department. And so oh, I was wow. just, I was just embraced, surrounded by Eastern European sort of filmmaking. And so there was a lot of theory involved. And I thought, okay, after sophomore year, there was nowhere to go because it was, you had to be a graduate student. You couldn't do production. So I thought, well, let me apply to USC. And then I got in. I went to USC. And it was the complete opposite. It was all production. And right. it was great. So I was hands on. It, and, you know, I had great classmates, a lot of classmates who went, and went on to, to make it. And then I decided to go to the AFI, which was all about story for directors. It was about story, story, story. And I thought I had a good balance. And so I really knew early on that I wanted to do this. I mean, I, when I was around 15, I needed to make money to pay for a, a junior prom, a, a, a girlfriend of mine invited me to. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm just going to walk from Broadway theater to Broadway theater to see what kind of job I can get. Wow. And I got a job at a Broadway theater as a first as a usher, and then. And do you remember I, which one? Yeah, well, the theater at the time was called the Little Theater, and now it's called the Helen Hayes Theater. Oh. So I was there during Torch Song trilogy, Gemini, Curse of the Aching Heart. Uh, I got to see, you know, Matthew Broderick, Faye Dunaway. Uh, wow. Uh, Danny Yellow, all these folks, and they would allow me to sneak up into the balcony to watch rehearsals oh. and then they had me moving sets around and i was a teenager and to me it was it was amazing so and i would i wanted to be in that milieu and i wanted to see uh, actors work and directors direct and so it really was a, a blessing and then when i went to la it was all about making movies making shorts i did a whole bunch of shorts and everything yeah that's is there a story that you're, you're dying to tell that you haven't told yet? Uh, it, do you want it to be a movie? Do you want it to be a TV series? Like I like being in, in television. I, I, I enjoy it very much. I also, uh, I get to, t as a director, I get to tell a story every week if I want to direct, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or, or as a producer in television. I do pitch and I have been involved with uh, uh, other uh, filmmakers where we have stories and series that we pitch to try to get off the ground. One of them uh, I like very much. It's a genre piece. And I, I guess you're aware that I, I, I've done a bunch of genre series like The Strain and The Fringe and uh, Grimm I did for five years. Oh, and yeah. so uh, I enjoy it that uh, I, I enjoy genre, especially in a cinematic level. A couple of guys and I are pitching a Latina vampire story. Yes. Very interesting. Yes. Oh, and, please. Uh, and, uh, and then I get, you know, I, I wrap myself around uh, different projects. But, yeah, I mean, to me, it's not like I have this story that I need to tell. Uh, you know, I, what I do is I want to see if I can tell the story and in layer it with stuff that I would like to communicate, whether it be political mm -hmm. or societal and uh, w but really embrace the genre or whatever uh, the story is. And uh, and that could come to me uh, through different means. And uh, in this case, it was a script that someone wrote that I really liked a lot. And uh, and then the series I get involved with, I uh, I tend to get involved with series that have some sort of social uh, you can hide a lot of social commentary, especially in science fiction and fantasy, because it, 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 people won't think, oh, you're giving us, you have this political viewpoint. You know, it's like <laughs> Star Trek, first interracial kids. Oh, no, but that's in the future. You know, it's like mm. you can get away with a lot more. And that's, I, I kind of like that. You know, oh. uh, now with, with the Law and Order stuff, I've been involved with the Dick Wolf people since uh, New York Undercover, and that was in like 1990. Yes, I remember that. 
96, 94. Okay. And so on and off, I've been involved with them and they're like a family. And uh, I, 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 I like to work and surround myself with, with fellow like-minded filmmakers, you know. You, you just mentioned sci-fi and subversion and then also uh, interraciality. I have to say, in Blue Tiger, as a, a Japanese-American, it's hard to count the number of movies that had uh, an Asian male lead having sex with not just Virginia Madsen, but, you know, white women in general. And uh, there's just a couple, like there's a Tony Collette movie and then like a couple other TV shows. But to me, I was like, you can do that? That's yeah. a thing? It was like, <laughs> you're a pioneer. And it, thank you. Thank you. You're showing us the way. And that's what we need. We need these examples. We need these these people out there. And um, yeah. yeah, no, that's a, the, yeah, that, that was impactful. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, uh, nowadays you'll see a lot more of that. And in SVU, we're embracing transgender, we're embracing uh, interracial, we're embracing this year, we really put ourselves in the world of post George Floyd and yeah. and what so, sort of police dynamic exists. And it hasn't made a lot of people happy because, you know, we're bringing out sort of the bad stuff within the good people. And uh, and even our own heroes have to question their own sort of implicit biases, which means that if someone like Mariska's character, Benson, it's questioning, oh, my God, have all, through all those years, have I had implicit bias and never noticed it? Well, the fact that she's asking herself those questions is is good, you know, mm -hmm. and um, um, and that's something that. Uh, thematically, well, this year and last year, the, the theme really has been how justice is parsed out differently depending on your color, your socioeconomic background, and who you know, and all that sort of thing. So last year's premiere with Ian McShane, where he played a Harvey Weinstein character, he, you know, basically uses all his uh, resources and almost gets off, and at the end, we get him. Uh, but and then we did an episode where we had three victims, one from the pro a black woman from the projects, uh, a transgender woman from uh, the village and uh, a white uh, sort of upper west side well to do. And each person, you can see how differently uh, they were treated. And so we're calling attention to that, the disparities and um, uh, and uh, I, I, I think that, see, those are things I'm attracted to. It's like, can we make some sort of, I don't know, I'm not saying we're going to make any changes, but can we make some sort of a sense of, create some awareness? We got a lot of flack from the first one of this season, which starts out with the Central Park bird guy and the woman, yeah. the parent, <laughs> oh, and, wow. him, and then it becomes sort of a George Floyd thing. And we were getting twi on Twitter, oh, you know, I can't watch SVU anymore. It's too political, really? you know, and really what, yeah. <laughs> you know, law and order has been a, been a name since 1990. Uh, SVU has been around since 1999. Yeah. IMDb says you're going to cross episode 500 this year, but uh, is there a, a subject that maybe is a little too real for audiences? You're just like, yeah, people aren't going to be able to handle this one. Uh, we got to set this one out. Or maybe next year. Maybe next year we'll talk about that. Well, I got to say, in the earlier years, there were some subjects. And so when I first, when they first uh, hired me to do an SVU was about 13 years ago okay. to direct. And I always, part of my process is, okay, send me the, the episodes before mine so I can look at them. Send yeah. me the scripts that haven't been shot yet. And my wife to this day says that I freaked out that I changed the locks on my doors that I kind of was depressed. There were some, there was subject matter early on that dealt a lot with kids. And mm -hmm. at that, and when I w was got involved, this when my kids were born, I was thinking, Oh my gosh, you know, this uh, also, when you know that some of this stuff is based on reality, mm -hmm. it's like, man, there's some crazy people out there. It's those things, those, the subject matter that, happen and it's and continue to happen and it's part of 
the human condition where we have people who are disturbed, we have people who are predators, we yeah. have people and they all live amongst us and you don't know it. And mm. then you get, you know, like lovely bones, you know, remember the movie mm. uh, with the Stanley Tucci yeah. and uh, the girl who's actually who's Judd. A, no. Oh, was actually Judd. Yeah. I think she was in it. Right. And, uh, but to me it was so disturbing because this girl, you know, teenager who's who pretty much killed by this uh, predator, and mm -hmm. her ghost is is in the movie and all that, and uh, and he's living amongst them, and, and you know that neighborhood, and he's a creepy guy. Those things scare are scary, you know. Mm -hmm. Is there a guest star that you want to book, or, or someone you want you have on your oh, wish list? Them. A lot of people I would love to talk. <laughs> you know, there was a time where getting on SVU was like the thing for uh feature actors oh and it still probably season, is i would imagine that's that's the cycle six, seven or something like that so that's, that's a coveted spot at, time, at, at that time i mean more than not because when you have a show that's that long you know uh there's new stuff that replaces in terms of where feature guys want to go to especially with streaming and cable mm -hmm. and all that but i remember it was robin williams and all these folks were there bradley cooper we go out to people and we see if we can nab somebody and so you know when when um it's time to get a new ep is is there a process like did, did they did they say no Berta, we like you but we're also thinking about michael mann and then you go michael mann he's not from the bronx he doesn't know the bronx <laughs> aaron sorkin he's never seen a nathan's hot dog <laughs> well, you know usually with the ep so you know the EP job, at least as a director for me, it's all encompassing. And the folks know in, in, in the business that if you're going to hire me as an EP director, it's because I'm going to be involved with every facet of the production, mm -hmm. casting, locations, costumes. I'm going to be the conduit between the writers and production. And uh, I'll be the director whisperer, but I'll also be the writer listener and all that sort of thing. When it comes to Law and Order SVU, this is very particular because I, uh, some time ago, I got called to do Law and Order Criminal Intent, and I was with one of the one of the staff writers, which became the showrunner, and uh, his name is Warren Light, and uh, we met over the phone. I was in L.A. and he said, "I, I hear you're going to be the EP director." I said, "I hear you're going to be the showrunner." I said, we're going to work together. It's going to be great. And it's been the best relationship I've had. Uh, one of the best with showrunner. We understand each other. We uh, collaborate, uh, respect each other. And he's a Tony Award winning playwright who has, you know, he's got a, an eye for the human condition in a way that other police procedural showrunners don't. Uh, so it's not just about, oh, how are we going to get the guy? How are we going to, you know, who did it or whatever. It's like, why? And who are these people? And why did they get there? And especially our main characters. So we did Criminal Intent together for two years. And then when he came back to us, I wasn't available the first time he was in SVU. I think I was doing Grimm. Uh, another show with two great showrunners that I, we had a great collaboration and then when he went back to SVU and I was available, it was like a no-brainer, you know, let's just do this again. We had worked together other, on another show called Lights Out. Mm, uh, I love that series. I did. I directed five of the 13 episodes, oh. including Ireland in the finale. I did an in-treatment episode for him. So when you have a relationship like that, that, you know, the showrunner gets to choose who he wants pretty much or at least pitch it. And uh, this was sort of everyone kind of knew uh, that that's a uh, that's a relationship that you want. It's going to only elevate, and also it just cuts a lot of the, the the headaches because we have a way of communicating that you know he doesn't have to spell things out. You know, I kind of mm -hmm. know what, what he's going for, and then I I can describe something to him, and he'll be open to it or not. You know, and that's <laughs> how it is. Mm -hmm. You had spoken uh, about uh, production in Puerto Vallarta. I um, lost in the Bermuda Triangle uh, film there. Did you use the same group there? Uh, was, was that part of the part of the swing? The thing we lost in Bermuda Triangle was uh, 
UPN or Paramount mm -hmm. were doing a series of these television movies and they were going to do them in Puerto in Mexico and they they also hired the guy that I hire uh, and they called me and said listen you you know they're doing a couple of these things want to do one of them and I said am I going to have the same crew the same people yep and I said let's do it and we went and I went down and, and uh, oh fantastic back, I uh, assistant director first assistant director on solo yeah, my first assistant director on Solo is a guy named Baton Silva. He was my first assistant on uh, Lost in Bermuda Triangle. He uh, is one of the premier first ADs in the world. He's Terrence Malick's AD. He oh. did a Yamatu movie. He's done all this. Oh, wow. He started directing, directed some movies, and then I brought him on to Grimm and then to Mayans, and now he's actually on the floor directing SVU. And the SVU that's airing tonight was one he directed. Ah. So it's all through the, that relationship, uh, and uh, and he's become a, an accomplished director in his own right. You have a very strong coaching tree for other directors. I mean, you, you know, MVP has his own his own tree, but uh, Tom Verico, who was the star uh, of Lost, he's uh, he's done a couple episodes on Bridgerton, and then, yeah. um, gosh, what was the other? I mean, uh, the the uh, oh the the the. Academy um, series, but um, I wanted to ask a question because mm. in Lost in uh, the Bermuda Triangle, which uh, for viewers that maybe should go check this out, uh, it's a movie where the island from Lost kidnaps a man's pregnant wife six years before Lost premieres, which is really spooky if you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to say when I was watching the movie and you hit us like real fast, I'm like we're hit real fast with a bunch of dire circumstances. Like there's a Sophie's choice where uh, they have to choose between the mother living uh, versus cancer or the child dying. And then they go down. Anyway, they go down to Bermuda and they just give this gentleman a, a pleasure yacht to cruise around. And look, he works in high finance. So you right. can write away. It's like he lives in Chicago. He has a yacht. It's fine. However, being able to pilot a pleasure yacht is something that an actor would lie about on their resume. Right, right, right. right. And so there's a <laughs> shot of Tom Verico piloting the yacht through a very crowded harbor. Did you have to have a conversation with the actor going like, can you actually do this? Or was there a captain hidden in, in the cabin immediately to get to, you know, to jump in? Well, these yachts, usually you have, you can man them from upstairs or downstairs. Uh... And so I, I think we had a captain below <laughs> <laughs> to do that. Because, uh, uh, and I remember, I think I remember the shot. You see him go out and there's a watch. Yeah. They go yeah. to, you know? <laughs> and there's a cruise ship back there. Cause it's like, you get that call from UPN or Paramount. It's like, Hey, uh, Mr. Barbara, um, do you know how um, the, the Queen Mary sank? Uh, no, uh, it's kind of a thing. <laughs> that was interesting because that cruise ship, we were watching the schedule. Cause I thought how, you know, it was supposed to be Bermuda. I wanted, if we were going to do Puerto Vallarta. How do we sell it? You know, I said, man, if there was a cruise ship there at the time, that'd be great, you know? And we got, we were looking at the schedules and said, okay, supposedly this one's going to be there. And we, we just scheduled around this so that the boat goes across the cruise ship. It's right there. Like, <laughs> set up right over the back. Like, oh, yeah. we're cutting the crop. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tom's doing great. And, in fact, I just got to notice that next week he's – uh, he's a guest at the DGA Latino Committee, a uh, oh. guest speaker. And uh, we keep in touch. I mean, because I'm involved in a lot of director skilled stuff, and he is also. And he's done great with Bridgerton. And Bridget, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and then with the Shondal and stuff, he's just been up as a sort of a overlooking all the Shondal land stuff. Fantastic. So, yeah. They, uh, was, it was uh, Umbrella Academy. That was the I other. directed him not only in that movie, but also in American Dreams. Oh. Which was a TV uh, show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometime later. Robin, you got a game for us tonight. Robin Sato's Cameo Party.
On the Robin Zitto Cameo Party, I make a list of celebrities from the website Cameo, which is a, a website where celebrities uh, can sign up and name their own price to make videos for the public for a price. And so I go and I make a list of relevant celebrities to our guest, and I have Kush and today Kai go up against our guest to guess the prices of each celebrity's cameo. Mm. Uh, it's Price is Right rules. We try to get as close as you can to the actual price without going over. Mm -hmm. And this week's winner gets a Mario van full of pebbles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I had said earlier uh, it was going to be every man for himself, but uh, me and Kai will be a team tonight. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Team, team Cushion Kai versus Team Noberto Barba. And right. uh, we can do the long game or we can do the short game. Let's start with the short game and You're maybe cool. we can squeeze into a long game. <laughs> if we need extra innings, it's there. It's there. All yeah. right. All right. I'm feeling it. I'm All feeling right. It. <clears throat> right now, we'll start off with Wait. Virginia Madsen. Oh, we, uh, we flipped a coin backstage. It came up tails. You called tails, Norberto. You're, you go first. So, All right, so Virginia yeah. Madsen. Yes. Three fifty. I think three fifty. Three fifty. That I, th I think that's a pretty good guess. I think I think that might be a little high though, Kyle. Like, what, what was the last thing you remember Virginia Madsen? And for me, it was Hand the Rock to Cradle. Yeah, I mean, I know she's done more stuff since then, but I loved, I loved some some Dunes and some Candy Mans, but who Candy I'm gonna, Man? Yeah. I'm gonna go. I, I'm gonna go like two seventy five. How you feel about that? I feel good about two seventy five. Okay. 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 Well, it will cost three hundred and twenty five dollars, <laughs> just barely over Norberto. So point four Kush and Kai this round. So who uh, you were two seventy? Oh, so uh, Price is Right style. If you go over, oh, then. I can't go over. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, that, no but, you got to get the boop, 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 boop. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was close, though. <laughs> yeah, you were right. Yeah, real close. You were right, you right were there. In. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Who we got? Who we All right. Well, since since he's been mentioned already, Mr. Mario Van Peebles. Hell, I just, I just want to know himself. what the price is for my own personal. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll do 400 Wow. Well, okay. Yeah, $400. $400. All right. Yeah. Uh, um, Kush, I think we got. I think we got a big, big league. I'm four hundred one. Four hundred one. Four hundred one. <laughs> Jeez, I I wanted to go five, but if you if you say four hundred one. Four hundred one. Yeah. We're taking the over. We're taking the over. I'm gonna <laughs> take your advice, Kai. Four hundred one. Four hundred one. For Mario Van Peebles, ninety nine dollars. Ah! Oh! No way. So oh. no points. I'm gonna have Mario Van Peebles host the show next. Week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. This next person is, in fact, alive, very much so. Mr. Barry Corbin. I thought you were going to say Harry Dean Stanton. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Barry goes, like, for $75. 75 Barry Corbin, he, he's uh, obviously in Solo. He, was, he, he played Perry White and Lois and Clark. He's uh, Northern Exposure. I think he's got his, his cult fan base. I'm gonna say 150, Kai. What do you think? I, I yeah, I'm a little out to lunch on this one. I'm gonna have to go with your your lead here. Mm -hmm. I'd say like close to 100, maybe. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll I'll take your direction on this one. Okay. Well, Barry is charging 175 dollars. Yes. Point four cushion, Kai. Oh my goodness! Oh well, my goodness! Obviously, I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> <laughs> we we threw it on you. Clearly, it's uh. Right. Right, oh, that just means you, you value these play. people yeah. more than they value yeah. themselves, and like that's that's really kind yeah. of beautiful, honestly. <laughs> I think we, I, you know, you, you could still take this. We we got we could do two more if if you're feeling froggy. All right, oh, yeah. let's do it. All right, um, we have Francois Chow. Do we remember Francois Chow from Blue Tiger? The gentleman on Lost. And uh, oh, yes. yes, he was Dr. Pierre Chang on Lost. 
I can't remember him. Um, <laughs> Good. Hold on, I got the guy's picture. <laughs> you just Google Francois Chow. Bonjour, uh, I'm Pierre Chang. Right <laughs> I, I got Francois Chow. Uh, oh, I remember him. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Okay. I don't Push. think he's the, I think I used it more than once. I think he would be like uh, 85 bucks. Okay. I, I'm going to go for like What is there a, is there a low threshold for like cameos like We can do 5 bucks. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. put like it in like fine. the 35 range yeah. maybe 35. like he'll show up. He's got he's got what he's doing but he can knock one of these out on his phone. You know what I mean? That's what <laughs> right there. <laughs> Oh, well, he's charging $75. Yay. You're so right just... there. You're, it's all right tied there. up. I know. He's so, 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 so. right there. <laughs> he was so much closer. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, right. Last one. This is for all the van of pebbles. <laughs> all right. Tamara Tooney. Ah. I don't know who oh. she is. She is. Uh, she plays the medical examiner on SVU, Dr. Melinda Warner. She was also one of uh, Al Pacino's girls in The uh, Devil's Advocate. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy movie. Uh, she was like Shaw. What was it? Uh, yeah. Uh, she, was, she was awesome. Uh, I would say $125. Kai, I'm going to defer to your knowledge on this one. Man, because there's she, there's a following, there's a fan base. I'm, I mean, I I would guess ju- like hundred hundred bucks, hundred bu- like a fan of throwing out a hundred bucks to be like, what's up, Tamara? Hundred bucks <laughs> it is. Wow, you guys are gonna be blown away by this because she's only charging fifty bucks for a cameo. Wow, uh, we both oh. went over. Oh, man. Uh, uh, taking uh, big uh, swings yeah, you got to stay with Charlize Theron. Is Adrian Brody on that? Oh. He's not. I looked for him. Adrian Brody banned from <laughs> well, banned. Like <laughs> Maybe like a hockey game. This ends in in a no contest. Oh uh, man, this this would be a, a microdose first. We, we have to do this again, Mr. Barba. Well, so. thank you for having me. It's it's fun to uh, actually talk about stuff I've done a long time ago. You know, there's a thing. I mean, real quick. Please. Martin Scorsese says that he cannot see the movies he's done in the past, that he can't see them. And, and then he says, because as human beings, we grow. And so the person who made that movie is different from the person we are now. And I don't see those movies anymore, except like I'll show my kids, you know, and say, you got to see this, and I walk away. But to talk about them takes me to a place where, you know, I, I felt awful about everything, anything I did. Well, you got to come back. There's a whole podcast about terror in the mall that we have about miniatures that we need to ask you about. Yeah. But oh, that'd, that'd be interesting. That was a hard movie to do. <laughs> you know, we were in Berlin in the winter, and we oh, and the, we, we had a, a the biggest sound stage in continental Europe, and we had to flood. We had to brace it uh, so we could put water in it. And the pipes would freeze, and all oh, this, and, and the actors were getting ear infections. Oh my god! Because of the water, it was terrible. And, and, uh, and oh, what no. was why it? am I laughing? But you know, a movie's gonna be really crazy when you got David Soul in it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a killer on the loose, and the actors like forty percent of that movie. People are neck deep or submerged in water and you said it was freezing uh, well, no, not inside inside they were heating it and that's why people were getting infections oh, but outside it was freezing mm-hmm. the pipe that'll be the next podcast all right yeah come back Please. all right law, law and order me. svu uh season 22 longest running dramatic series on uh, primetime tv episode 500 this year is coming big event it just 
we, yeah, is there a count? Because uh, of COVID, I think it's going to be in the beginning of next season because we right. have a shortened schedule. Mm. There it is. Yeah. Numberto Barba, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Robin, you do a thing here. But tell us about that. I do. Uh, I do a weekly written craft beer review that goes yeah. up on the Boz Net. It's called mm. Polite Beer Expression. Delicious. We've been doing Sweetberry February. We'll, we'll bring you something real special. So look out for those. Those go up on Wednesdays on the Boz Net at noon, California time, uh, because we like to sleep in. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking That's forward to time. that. Okay. <laughs> You, you got a thing to plug that we do. Absolutely. Cushion Kai 53 coming out March 17th. Uh, we're doing uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Oh, my God. I can't David wait. David Bowie project. Right? Oh, that, I can't wait. Uh, oh, that is exciting. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I, I can't look. F- uh, I, I can't wait until I can rehear what I'd already forgotten. <laughs> much like listening to uh, Mr. Barba. Uh, just going back through uh, some old podcasts. Like, you could have convinced me we watched any movie from 1973 to 1989 about New York. I just say any title you want and be like, yeah, you, you reviewed that. I'd be like, yeah, no, a thousand percent. A thousand again. Of course we did. Uh, and I have uh, taken such positions in the past. But uh, no, check that out, everybody. Uh, uh, the Man Who Fell to Earth, uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, a.k.a. Uh, wow. recognizing one year of a lockdown. Wow. Did, were you guys, uh, Kai in Florida, were you guys on the 17th as well? Or was it a few days before? Was it a few days after? Ooh, Everybody shifted right. that week, but yeah, it was did Florida right ever that... lock down? <laughs> they <laughs> sort of did, like civilians sort of did, but then mm-hmm. the state was like, "Well, we have a bunch of essential workers," which kept expanding. So you just see a lot of people on the highway, and you're like, oh, "You're not like staying home, home, are you?" And you're like, "Florida, yeah." So well, they had to keep the gators off the roads, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mentioned episode 53. I'm going to mention I'm going to plug episodes 19 and 29 in our for our host tonight. Check out Solo. I apologize in advance for the audio. We were young, we didn't know any better. Uh, uh Blue Tiger. You get yeah. to hear me barely hold on to the table as I'm just <laughs> <laughs> You actually got better as you got sloshed at pronouncing Japanese names. That, that is, <laughs> Greg, if you just listen over the arc, it is. No, it helps. It helped. It did. Next week, uh, I debut a brand new series, The Kick-Ass Movie Podcast, Ooh. February 24th. Woo! Me and director Len Kabazinski. We're talking King of the Kickboxers. It's going to be a mini series. There'll be six of them this year. This mm. is episode one. You'll check that out. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, all the usual spots. And to the tastic. Thank you, Kush. It's going to be great times, guys. For Noberto Barba. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. I've been Kush Hayes. I've been Ravi. I've been Kai. And y'all have been you. Thanks for being a part of this macro dose. From the Bosnet family. Michael, man, he's not from the Bronx. He doesn't know the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs>